right. There we go. Are we live or not yet? Let me know in the chat. We may not be live yet because it's not 1015 yet. <clears throat> but let me know in the chat. If I'm talking to you, let me know. If I'm not, well, then I'm not. So let's see. We can hear you. Okay, so we're up. We're up. We're up and running. We're up and running. Sweet. Loud and clear. Yeah, I got that microphone going. Microphone. All right. So let me wipe off my glasses and we'll get started in a second. I'm going to give me a little clap to know where to edit off whenever I make this an actual post. But before we do that, what's up, everyone? Where are y'all from? Put in there where people are from. This will be just us right now. And then we'll uh, I'll clap and we'll get to the to the meat. Hello, flying s'more. Actually, I'm going to get on the live on my phone so I can read it a little more closely to my face. Let's see. There it is. Visit. Ah, there I am. This is weird seeing myself. There we are. Okay, cool. We got Minnesota, Germany, Huntsville, Alabama, Canada, Halifax, Nova Scotia, Lawrence Flipping, Kansas. Go to 1900 for me. 1900 Barker. We got Vermont. We got Seattle. We got Canada north of Lake Superior. And meat is yummy. All right. Spokane, Washington. We got Greenville, South Carolina. You work at 1900. Oh, nice. Very cool. Tell Sam I said hello. I'm from the South Pole. Get out of here, Harris from Norway. Let's see. Where, where are people from? Where are people from? I'm going to see if I can make the heart. There it is. I feel like if I push hard enough, it happens. Anyway, it worked once. Um, I broke the Aurea, okay? I broke the glass Aurea. Ah! Okay, it's okay. And I broke the MK dripper. I broke everything. I mean, it was my fault. I stacked all this up like an idiot, knowing that I'm going to wave my arms a lot like I'm a motivational speaker. We know, And I'm doing it again. I don't learn my lesson. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, the glass Aurea is bye-bye, and so is the MK dripper that was made for the guy I coached last year. But guess what? We're going to keep rumbling. Let me just uh, wipe that glass off, and I'll clean the other side of the table later, just in time for me to cut my foot open. Because y'all better believe I'm barefoot in here. All right. What was I even doing? What was I even doing? All right. Let's get all this in one place as a visual reminder to clean it. Okay, well, we, we, we will not be talking about the glass Oreo or the MK Dripper. So that made things easy. Okay, no worries. Let's see. We have Phoenix, Arizona. We have, oh, we'll get to the meat. Yes. Chicago, Wake Forest. Uh, yes, we in stream, honestly. Hey, it's unfiltered. I don't even need a brewer. I don't need a filter. I don't need a brewer. Doesn't matter. Uh, that brewer's on your Christmas list. Oh, no. Um, Lance is filtering out swears. It's true. It's true. Steps on glass. That's why plastic drippers are the best. It's true. We can talk about their fragility. Portland had a charge of glass effects. The taste. I love it. I love it. Okay. Now we're actually going to start for real, for real. Now that I've, uh, that was like the inaugural breaking of the glass, which is necessary. That's a piece of ceramic right there. Nice. I love breaking stuff. It's so much fun. Ready, set, and go. What's up, everyone? We are going to be talking about dialing and pour overs today. So all things pour overs. So you'll see I have just a few uh, of these right before, I mean, right earlier for people watching currently, uh, there was a lot more here, but I broke a lot of them in an act of flamboyance, which is not unlike things that I do. But anyway, uh, so we're going to talk about my approach to pour overs and how I think people can, oh, there's glass still on that Hario switch base. I'll just need to hand wash that later because that's dangerous. It looked a lot cooler when the stack was higher, but 
yeah, so we're going to talk about uh, approach to dialing in, what you should look for in a coffee, how you should kind of do the initial approach, how you should change to certain tastes when you're tasting your coffee, um, what what makes sense, what what uh, you know changes in the variables should you be making in order to improve upon the taste experience for your own uh, personal enjoyment. So let's get going. But first, a quick check with the chat. Quick check with the chat. Uh, perfect. Nice. Ooh, making Advent, that one advents right uh, today. What's up? What's up? Okay. So, yes, uh, for me personally, I think everyone kind of has a go-to recipe that they, you know, kind of start with. A lot of people, it's like the Hoffman single cup. Um, a lot of people do four six. A lot of people do the one pour, and so on and so forth. So, what I always like to tell people whenever they are trying to dial in a coffee, help me, I can't dial in the coffee. It's not tasting good. Is always start with your go-to pour over. Whatever recipe makes you feel comfortable, whichever one that you do often that you kind of understand. And we're going to start from there because obviously whatever method you're using is more tailored to your taste preferences. Of course, you might you might be in an area where th there's another potential base recipe that would do you better, but you don't know that yet. And so for now, we're going to talk about deviating slightly from that base recipe. For me, I always start based off of my flavor preferences. I always start with uh, essentially a variation of my one to one recipe, which I have a few videos on. So I still do variations of that, which just means I do a bloom. So typically it's three times the weight of the grounds, unless I have something that can stop the droppings, uh, the drips through the, like this, which can stop the drip, stop the drips during bloom, post bloom. So I'll do three times the weight or double weight if it's with that. And then I wait 45 seconds, a minute, two minutes, depending on the coffee. And then I pour the rest of the water in at varying kettle speeds, at varying flow rates, depending again on the coffee. So you're asking, well, what, what do you mean by depending on the coffee? How, what is your approach? What does that even mean? Like, how are you looking at something and going, okay, I know I need a heavy turbulent flow on this coffee in order to do X, Y, Z to the coffee. How do I know that you need more of a, uh, a slower laminar flow with this, or you need two minute bloom, or you need 30 second bloom? Because it all sounds so trivial. It sounds silly, but in reality, it makes massive, massive differences. So a lot of it's based on the the way you're extracting it. We all know that two different coffees, both both extracted at 20% or even two of the same coffees, let's say two of the same coffees extracted at 20% extraction, even if they're both at, you know, 1.4 TDS, 20% extraction, they can be completely different. And this is easily provable if you have two different grinders, dial them both into 1.4 and 20%. And what's going to happen is they're going to be two completely different flavor profiles, which just kind of shows you that you can achieve a similar extraction with a completely different profile, just depending on your grinder, depending on the different variables of the extraction you have in your command. And some of these variables include your flow rate, include your grind size, include your ratio and things like that. So, and include bloom time. So whenever I'm getting a coffee, let's say I have a super lightly roasted coffee. Let's say uh, we'll name a roaster that a lot of people know. Let's say I have a Tim Wendell Bow coffee. It's it's pretty lightly roasted, not the lightest, but it's definitely in the top like one percent um, uh, of specialty as far as light goes. When you when you take into account all the specialty roasters, it's it's very much up there. When I get a Tim Wendell Bow coffee, let's say it's a really lightly roasted like washed Kenya coffee. So when I get that coffee, I'm thinking, okay, this is a washed Kenya. So washed, it's going to be a little bit more resistant to extraction, at least in my experience, as regards uh, the flavors that are going to be put out. You're going to get a lot more flavor at a lower extraction with a natural Kenya than typically you will with its corollary as a washed. So I kind of view that washed coffees as uh, um, maybe it's a little bit... Um, it's, there, there's not as much flavor intensity right off the bat with those coffees for the most part. Of course, you get incredible washed Kenyas every now and then that are so potently fruity that it's shocking. But we're going to we're going to take just generalizations here because I'm trying to you know give you a vague general approach that has worked for me for many years. So we start with uh, we start with kind of considering the coffee. So we have washed Kenya and it's really lightly roasted. All three of those things are kind of telling me, all right, this might be a little resistant to extraction, which means the way I might approach a darker roasted natural uh, Colombia is not going to be the way I approach this Kenya. And I'm not trying I'm not trying to say we're trying to reach 22 percent extraction with this washed Kenya. But in order to hit, let's say we go 19 percent with uh, the, the natural Columbia. So we're, we're extracting right in the middle of that range that is, you know, the study long ago said people like 18 to 22% extraction. Let's say we go for just 19 with that natural Columbia. If I implement that same process 
onto this lightly washed Kenya, we're probably getting 17% or something. So it's going to be, a, and, and it's going to be a lot tighter tasting, right? It's not, you are not really busting through with a lot of that intensity that we're wanting. A lot of those aromatics, a lot of those more intense uh, acids and viscous compounds. So um, when I'm looking at that, I'm thinking, okay, I really need to ensure that I have a bit higher ratio because ratio is like the number one arbiter of extraction, which makes sense, right? You can easily prove this with espresso or a pour over. Just keep pouring water through and you're going to have a higher extraction percentage, a de doy. And so, um, and that's not necessarily the case with grind size because you can grind so finely that channels will begin to occur and can lower your extraction yield, a la the Hinden paper. Of course, that's geared towards espresso, but if you're not doing a lot of agitation in your uh, pour over bed, it's likely going to channel a lot if you go really finely. So that's not really the, the main arbiter. The main arbiter here is, uh, is, is ratio, and that's because even if it channels, if you keep adding water, you're going to increase your extraction until it hits the ceiling. OK, easy enough. So I first immediately know, all right, I'm going to do roughly a one to 17 ratio or something around there. The second thing I'm considering largely is, all right, so we know it's going to be a little bit more difficult to to pull out. How how fresh is this roasted? Is this is this really old? Is this super fresh? Is this in the middle? Uh, and that to me, depending on the coffee, because they all have different uh, they're all different relative to how um, uh, how lightly they're roasted, right? So a darker roasted coffee, they're going to peak at different times than lighter roasted coffees. But at the very beginning with a really lightly roasted coffee, there is a ton of gas pent up in there. Um, it, it's not as much as a darker coffee, but that's when the most gas will be coming out. And you're really wanting to rid yourself of that gas to have the best experience as possible. Now that gas is, there's not been as much gas formed, much as much CO2 formed during the roasting process. So you won't see this massive bloom like you do in fresh dark roasts, but you still need to push that gas out. So one, because it's more lightly roasted, it's a bit harder or it takes a bit longer for that water to penetrate the grounds. And two, uh, because it's taking longer, it's going to take a bit longer for that CO2 to escape, even though there's trace amounts of it, comparatively speaking. And in order for diffusion to really begin to occur in, in, in you know proper quantity that, that's sufficient, that's even throughout the bed, we got to displace that CO2 in order for the diffusion of those um, of those acids and those compounds to get out of the grounds. So uh, I'll take that into account. And if it's really fresh and it's it's a Wendell bow, five days off roast, I'm blooming that bad boy for two minutes. All right. I'm going to sit there and I'm just letting that, I'm letting it get crusty. And I don't care if that bed gets cold because I'm about to douse it with such hot water. It's going to send those elements screaming into my cup. All right. They're going to be screaming in there. And then I'm going to come in with a heavy flow that's turbulent AF because Kenya's tend to not produce nearly as many fines as something like in Ethiopia. So I'm not that worried about stalling anyway. So I'm just going to yeet that in there with some heavy turbulence at a high flow rate, probably 10 grams a second. Feeling feisty. We're going max flow on that fellow. I don't care. And I'm just going to yeet the rest of that water in. It's going to raise that temperature of the uh, of the bed really high. If you do enough turbulence, it should unsettle enough fines in order to really kind of clog that paper filter enough to slow the drawdown so it's not a one minute brew or whatever it might be. And so, um, yeah. So, and then if you if you get this Tim on the and it's six weeks off roast, it's much older. I'm not blooming that long. The CO2 has been releasing. That's one of the big reasons we're blooming. It's to rid of CO2 and it's to fully saturate that bean. Saturation will be much easier when there's less CO2 inside. It will want to go in there. there. There ain't CO2 pushing the water back out, right? So it's similar in espresso. You're going to see lower peak pressures the less the CO2, the less CO2 there is in a coffee. It's easier to create pressure because that CO2 is causing a lot of that pressure creations, uh, a la Gagne, based off of... Uh, God, I feel like I'm Michael Scott saying the Michael Jordan quote to Michael Scott. I, I'm, I'm given a Gagne quote based off of it. Like, I think a thesis or something he read. But anyway, yes. So I might shorten my bloom to 30 seconds and I might be a little more gent gentle in my final pour. So I'm taking into account the roast state. I'm taking into account relative roast degree. I'm taking into account origin lightly and variety. The Kenya coffees tend to be uh, pretty dense unless you have a, like AA or the bigger beans. If you have, well, actually they're not, it's not quite true. They're not that, they're not that dense unless you have pea berry. I've been drinking a lot of pea berry lately. So really the AAs, that's a screen size. That's like qu a, quite a big bean. So they're not that, uh, they're not very dense actually. Uh, in comparison to like Pacamara, they're, uh, they're dense as heck. But um, anyway, so you're taking into account these things because there's a loose trend that I have anecdotally noticed between density and extractions. But um, 
at least for flavor. I'm not saying extraction percentage flavor wise. I feel like, um, or not, I feel like anecdotally coffees that tend to be a bit more dense, uh, tend to need a bit more aggression during the extraction. Again, that's not saying let's eat it to 25%. That's never tasting good to me. Don't worry about it. Now, typically when I'm brewing my one to one or the verify uh, variable one to one, I am typically getting around 19 to 20% extraction at max. And that's because I find that there are, it's the most enjoyable cup. If you get it a certain extraction the way most people grind though, if you're getting 19 to 20%, it will likely taste sour or it will taste stratified in its extraction. And the reason for this is because I grind a whole lot coarser than most of you all probably do. And so I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to optimize my coffee at a coarser grind setting to give me more even flow through the bed, relying on kind of fines migration in order to clog the uh, the filter a little bit in order to slow down the draw through through the uh, through the bed. I'm allowing the bed to filter out a lot of those fines and particles, and we're having a good time. Now, a lot of people go a lot more finely, and they tend to um, they tend to do multiple pours. And they tend to still hit about, you know, 19 or 20 percent. And those coffees tend to not taste very good. And that's when they're going online looking for all these recipes. And I also believe that's why a lot of people immediately say I need to do really high extraction. There tends to be a very common trend in the coffee rabbit hole where people go, yeah, I like Starbucks. It's cool. It's whatever. I like sitting there and reading my Hegel uh, because I look really cool reading Phenomenology of Spirit. True story. I've done that. And I'll sit in there with a pipe and God asked to leave the balcony because I'm cool like that. Um, so sitting there reading Phenomenology of Spirit and you're going like, oh, this is where the young Marx was uh, influenced so heavily, um, you know, yada, yada, yada. And so you're sitting there, you're thinking, you're, you're, you're contemplating, you're, you're, you know, hitting tobacco, you're drinking some you're drinking some coffee when you're like 20, 21 years old, uh, and you're you're cool. You're cool, right? Then then later you you taste that natural Ethiopia at your local coffee house because they were like, yo, you're cool. You should try this. I like chatting with you. And you're like, yeah, cool. I'll try it. You try it and you're like, what the daggum heck was that? That is so weird. Did you put blueberry syrup in my coffee? And they say, no, man. No, we did not put. Don't you say that. That was straight from the cherry itself. Be cool, man. And you're like, wow. That is mind blowing. So you go home, you buy a Chemex and you start brewing up your coffees at home. You get your first geisha and you're like, oh my God, what is this? This is so dope. But then as time goes on and you actually start to, you get out of that honeymoon phase, you're still cloying at another honeymoon phase. So you stumble upon forums. You stumble upon these, this, these, these people that have read, you know, surface level literature in the coffee world. And they're like, yo, high extractions, best extraction. You're like, Man, that sounds about right because I've the more I've been drinking coffee, the less I'm satisfied with these coffees. They there's like a bitterness and a sourness, and I, I can't hit it with every coffee. It seems that it's so different every time I'm brewing. I can't just settle on something. I got to figure something else out. And boom, guess what? You bought a you bought a refractometer and you're you know titrating crap, and you're saying, oh my god, this only hit 23 percent. Spit it out of my mouth. That's not high enough. And then you go on forums and you know people are like, oh my god, I'm I did a, this three pour uh, coffee on my V60 and you say three pours, that's not nearly enough to hit 24% extraction. What are you doing? Get out of here. You don't deserve coffee. So you know what I'm talking about. You understand. And so when you have all of that, I think it, it's like, that is a natural thing. And I think the next evolution is realizing, oh God, oh God, we have not been enjoying coffee and we've been an a-hole this whole time. And then when you figure out that, oh, you know what? Numbers don't matter. It's like in the gym, numbers don't matter. You're going to the gym, go to the gym, whatever. Or you don't have to, I don't care, you know, but it's like numbers don't matter, but the plates you're putting on there don't matter. You don't have to be Sam Su look up in here. You don't have to be see bum. No one cares, all right? We're here to share in this endeavor. All right, so anyway, that was a really weird tangent. I, I just got into it and I kind of like took on the character and I just went with it. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, that's called method acting, kids. That is a very... Uh, Highbrow technique that was, no, I'm kidding. Um, okay. Christian Bale, Batman, Batman, DC, don't like Marvel movies, sue me. All right. That's just a little ADHD thread that I know a lot of you can sympathize with, and I'm feeling extra ADHD tonight. All right. Where were we? These look like Jolly Ranchers. Tell me I'm wrong. I'm not wrong. That's part of that ceramic uh, pour over that broke. All right. <clears throat> Okay, actually, I should probably read the checks because I've been I've been ranting. I've been ranting. 
Are you still doing the 50 degree bloomer? Has it become too much of a pain? No, it's not a pain. I still do it. And in fact, um, so someone asked if I still do a 50 degree or 60 degree, the Samo bloom, essentially. Um, I do it. Not all the time. It depends on the coffee. As I said in that video, it's not going to be the best with every coffee. There are some coffee it's, coffees it's phenomenal with. You may find a coffee that doesn't need that extra bit of early extraction, that doesn't need that heat in order to really push the extraction. So you will lose a bit of extraction. But in reality, what are you going to do? Numbers don't matter. So um, yeah, uh, I still do it. And in fact, I've been working on a great, I call it a pseudo, uh, um, a filter pseudo O get it 2.0 pseudo O anyway. Um, I got, I got a filter profile I've been working with on the Unica that I do a Samo bloom on. Well, on this, it's called a Lance Samo bloom because it was both of our ideas. And then I made the video crediting him with a pour over. And I was like, let's do it on espresso. So it was kind of a joint idea that we had while on a call with Unica. But anyway, I do it on this and it is like freaking hoisty. It's so good. Um, and then I dilute it with water, right? Um, yeah, no, I still use it. Yeah, absolutely. It's very easy because the water heats up so quickly. And so I do it with coffees that give me a longer bloom time, or I do have two kettles. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, I got a little water. So in that kettle it may not be the best thing ever to reuse water, but you know, I don't know I'm just going to do it. So, you know, what are you going to do? If and when you do your catch-all recipe, it'll be good to know why you recommend pouring in a small circle inch wide, especially in terms of fines on aggression, chase impact, and how you got that idea. Great question. Thank you, Rohan. Okay, so if and when you do your catch-all recipe, it'll be good to know why you recommend pouring in a small circle inch wide, especially in terms of fines migration, agitation impact, and how you got to that idea. Very good question. So whenever I'm pouring V60, I... You know what? We're going to just brew a cup. I have water heated up so I could brew a cup. And I kind of wanted to show off this new little Akaya Pixis I got. I just wanted to do it on my hand. That is, I have bare palms, by the way. So this isn't a great, you can look at Ugo's story on Instagram for a more realistic size hand. Uh, but it's like, I mean, this thing's 20. I was just trying to show it on a, look at that. It is really weird trying to do this on the camera. There it is. Like, look at that. That's ridiculous. That's so tiny. It's cute. Like, this is the lunar, okay? That's the lunar. Let's put on a white background. Y'all know how small the lunar is. <laughs> That's ridiculous. All right, so I'm going to weigh some coffee out, and I'm going to talk you through my approach to pour-overs. This does not have to be your approach as far as the base recipe. The variable changes I make do have to be your approach, though. There is no argument there. Do you hear me? That is how, okay, being like Barney Stinson, just, okay, okay, what coffee y'all be using? Yeah, I forgot. I was going to do a little homage to fellow tuber, Paul Russell, and an homage to my boy, Pepe in Ecuador. We're going to do 15 grams. I usually do 15 to 250. Simple, good to go, right around 117. It's, you know, decimals, but, you know. No one cares. So made out my weighed out my sh fifteen schwiggy schwam fifty five. Let me get that. Uh, this is a little too coarse. No, that's it right there. I'm at dial twelve on the ek, which is about eh, seven o'clock, maybe just before seven, quarter to seven. I'm gonna get my little arty te. Lloyd Christmas. Okay. All right. Yep, nothing in the shoot. Clean that. Oh, nope, there's a little bit. A little bit. Get out of here. This thing has the worst workflow ever, I'll be honest with you. But, geez, Louise, do I like the coffee it makes? If the coffee's good. I also have a slow feeder here now. So I'm not I'm not grinding my finger up. It's so slow. Like, you have no idea how slow this is. It's so slow that I kind of prod it through. It's mostly because it's really small. The aperture is 20. So don't worry about my finger. I'm still a good six inches away from the burrs. All right. All right. Let me get a little bit of Monica in my life. A little bit of Jessica by my side. A little bit of Rita's all I need. A little bit of Tina's all I see. A little bit of Zandra in the sun. A little bit of Jessica on my lawn. A little bit of something that I need. All right. We got that junk, that joint wetted up. Here we go. Beep, beep. 
Turn off the little cute pixels. There we go. All right. Here we go. Just a walk. So on the bloom, you know, you can make a little divot. I will say, I, I don't always. I use more shallow beds. If you have a deeper bed, you definitely need to. I've not seen much of a difference when it's this small. 15 grams, pretty shallow. Yeah, in a cone, it's deeper than if 15 were in like a flat bed, but it's still pretty shallow. So I'm going to hit go, go. Wake me up. And I do just a little, like as Rohan was saying, it's like a, it's like the size of a quarter in the U.S. currency. I just kind of go in that circle there. Now, the reason is simple. Also, I will swirl sometimes. Sometimes I'll WDT, uh, not in a V60 really, because I'm scared of per piercing the filter. Sometimes I'll take a stick. Uh, it all also depends on how I'm viewing that coffee and what I think uh, it can take. And sometimes it's off experience with said coffee. But as I'm sitting here laying this bloom, Reason I pour into that center is there is, I've, I've been posting on Instagram, reposting this other Instagrammer who has taken a, a die cut of a V60 and it showed what it looks like to pour inside. Now, I don't think that's a perfect replica because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things you're not taking into account when you have half of a half of a V60. There's just a lot of things at play that aren't really capable of being at play there. And it's also gonna be a skewed view because you're looking at the center close to where you're pouring, yada, yada, yada. But anyway, I pour in the center because the majority of the coffee is in that quarter size of the center. If y'all were to take a quarter and cut out that bit of the coffee and pulled it out, that's the majority of the coffee right there. Bada bing, bada boom. And as you're pouring in the center, you're able to pierce to the lowermost part, which is objectively the least hit part of the coffee bed. So you're not getting, you're not hitting that part of the coffee like at all with the water going through. Some of it will seep to it, but it's wanting to bypass around in through the ridges around the edges of the coffee. There we are. So what you're seeing, you can probably kind of see it here, maybe a wee bit, a shmee bit, but we have these ridges on a V60, so the filter's not perfectly suctioned in there, and water's going around that. That's very easy to prove. Just take a filter and close off the bottom of the V60, don't use a filter, and, and pour in there. It's not a perfect example because you also have the sides to catch fines, and you don't with that, but you're going to see it drops like one gram every five seconds. So... What's going on is when you're pouring in there with high turbulence, you're able to disturb the bed and create kind of a billowing effect with added uh, oxygen bubbles down there, which is giving extra agitation due to that turbulence. Now, because of that, you're able to, with just that pour, without needing to swirl, you're able to uh, uh, eject some of those fines to the outer walls. So as that slurry is bellowing, and you're having that, uh, that air coming down with the turbulence, it's like you're just, you're just pelting them down there, paintball, bang, 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 splattering everywhere. Those little fines, they get suction right in that wall. And it allows for kind of like a, a hampering of the drawdown effect, all right? So we're also pouring in the center again because we're wanting to agitate that very center. The edges are going to be agitated. You might think, oh no, there's a little half a centimeter around the rim that's not very wet when I do the pour. Listen, let me tell you, that is literally a tiny little sliver around the top. If you were to be able to freeze time cut it in half, cut it in four, so whatever you want to cut it, and you were to look at what's not wetted, it's like maybe half a gram of coffee or like a gram of coffee, maybe. Uh, so don't worry about that. You don't need to waste a whole spiral pour hitting the outside. That's silly. Do a little swirl to bring it back in, you're, and you're going to be using that water for a better purpose hitting the center of the very middle of that cone because that's where the most under extraction is objectively occurring. So you want to really ensure that you are just smash in that middle, right? You want to smash that like and subscribe button while we're at it because I'm still growing this channel. And if you haven't subscribed to it, what are you doing? We'll segue. You know, I like segues with my Squarespace ads. I got a good one in the video coming out, um, but it'll be the last one for a while. So um, was that all the question I'm forgetting? In, uh, especially in terms of funds migration, agitation impact, and how you got to that idea. Agitation impact. So if you also, I will say a good thing about that die cut I posted on there where you see the water going in. I've also done an experiment with this uh, and I did it with, um, what did I do it with? I had it on my Instagram like two years ago, but it was showing the difference between laminar and turbulent pour. But the agitation impact is wildly different between the two. You can get a lot of agitation with laminar. Don't get me wrong. You pour really fast with laminar. You're going to agitate the mess out of that bed, but it's not doing nearly as much impact at, um, uh, especially on the walls where, as, where the, how do you explain this? You're doing a lot of agitation, it's really hard to explain because I'm so visual. I see it in my head and I'm trying to articulate what I'm seeing. But um, you know what? I'll show you. We have a glass of water. 
We pour a laminar. You see nothing. I need to go up higher because I'm pouring faster. There, you see those bubbles? That's 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 turbulence. We go back to laminar where it's not breaking up. Go back to turbulence. Okay, so that turbulence is what is causing a very intense mixture on the bottom that's allowing that shoving of fines to the walls. Yes, you're still going to have that with laminar flow, but it's a more efficient way of bringing that oxygen down in order to really riz stuff up down there. It's going down there, you know, rizzing them up, as the kids say, as the, as the Utes say. As the Utes. So that's what uh, turbulent is, right? We're not talking about drips before we get to the, where, I, where can I show this? That cup's filled up. We're not showing it. We're not talking about the stream and it's dripping. You don't want the stream to drip. Le a turbulent flow, that stream's going to hit the water without breaking up. And then right when it goes under, it's like doom, doom, doom. You've got like crazy stuff going on. It's like a mosh pit down there. All right. I got to put this thing somewhere so I can drink my coffee. We'll put it. That's what basket or trays are made for, right? Drip trays. I think so. I need to get those new black barista hustle bowls. Those things look sick. All right. Nice. Broken stream. How I came to that idea. Came to that idea actually years ago because I was making Kalitas and I remember I would see coworkers pour around the edges, the ruffles of the Kalita. And I was going, yo, 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 yo. Why are you doing that? You are literally just straight up going past the bed of coffee. Like it's on the other side of the paper. What are you doing? They're like, well, no, it's still in the bed though. It's still getting contact. You see it's building up. You can look in there and see the water's built up behind the paper. I'm like, yeah, but think about it, dude. Your coffee takes a lot longer to drain through that filter and out into the cup, right? Then, then if you were to just pour water into that filter or into that um, brewer, right? Which is saying that it's a lot harder for that water to re-enter the filter than it is to come out, right? So if it's out, it ain't wanting to go back in. It's trying to get out. That's the whole point. So how you think in the water on the outside is going to go back in? Yeah, it's going to turn a little coffee color because it's going to be able to pull some that have been sitting on that edge. It's going to be able to pull a little bit of that out. But for the most part, it's like, it's mostly just bypass. Yeah, it might mix with a little bit of the dissolved coffee that makes it through the filter, but is that actually causing any extraction? Let's say 10% by bypass. That is literally bypass, all right? Now, I know I'm going to get pushback for that from some people once this goes live, uh, but, you know, it is what it is. It's just what it is what it is, all right? Why do you think we're getting so much more extraction on no bypass brewers? <laughs> Get out of here with that. Okay. All right. So I had that. Then I started thinking, well, this probably happens with V60 too. You're pouring water so quickly. Obviously, it's going to get through that filter because you're yeeting it in there, right? Anyway. All right. So um, let's see. I should have bought Source Stripper when it dropped. I snoozed and now it's sold out. Yeah. I actually, I actually quite enjoy it. I love being able to stop the bloom. It's an addiction of mine. My, my strange addiction. I'm like, let me stop that bloom. I will say, though, it seems, I don't know what the final version's like. This is a little bit, uh, I don't know, it's like plastic on the bottom. And so I don't know how I like that for, uh, I'm not worried about the plastic being plastic, but it's more like cleanliness. It's kind of hard to keep clean with these threads. Um, but this may not be the final one. He sent me one early, so I don't know. La -da 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 -da. Uh, wash the is going to be a problem because I feel like I want to give it a lot of agitation and extract more of the that usually exceeds the brew time because of fines. Yeah, you don't want to over-exaggerate Kenyas anyway because they taste the best at like 19, 20%. So don't push it. A lot of people, again, I'm getting back on the rant for just a second. A lot of people have this idea of more coffee, more good, more coffee, more good, more coffee, not more good, more coffee, not more good. And people also try to push this like this pathetic argument of we need to we need to be able to do 12 grams to 300 grams of coffee so that we're not wasting the bean. Yeah, but if it ain't tasting, what's the daggone point? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, if we're just trying to be as sustainable as possible, do one gram of coffee and just spritz your water. You know what I'm saying? It's like we're either doing sustainability, in which case we probably shouldn't even drink coffee, or we're doing it because it's freaking good. And it's not freaking good at really high extraction yields. It's just not. It's not. And honestly, you can kind of like prove that scientifically, but... We won't get into that because I've already gone into it. All right. Um, 
Pea berry is known for higher sweetness. Someone said, is it known for higher sweetness? Yes, it is known for that because it is two cherries in one. Therefore, you have like not double the dense, not double the amount of sugars inside. But yes, but then then, then when you talk about that though, there's a there's a there's a logical fallacy there. When you talk about that, the fact of the matter is, is the sweetness in coffee is like 10 times less. No, no, it's like 0.001% of what table sugar is or something like that. It's not detectable to the tongue is what I'm trying to say. I don't remember what the, the number is, but the sh sugar, the sugar, the presence of sugar in coffee is not detectable to the tongue. There is sweetness in coffee, but it's not from sugars. Um, we don't really know what that phenomenon is from. It's the same thing as like you could have the acid that is directly related to cherry, but it could taste like almond and no one would taste cherry in it. That is because it's freaking weird. All right. And you're freaking weird, Derry. Letterkenny fans. If you're a Letterkenny fan. Love you. Um, because you're freaking weird, Derry. Um, what ground size on the scope for 7 8? Would you recommend to start with five to five and a half to six? Uh, and you're using Hoffman one cup recipe. What are you doing? You're on my channel. What is this? Matt Foley. Government cheese in a van down by the river. I probably clipped the crap out of that microphone. Um, bu, 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 bu. Ew, I hit rant hits hard. Folks trust rate wasters way too much. It's true. It's true. Lance one said that he is about six and it's not adjusted to zero. Lance one said that he is about six. Uh, yeah, I don't think mine's adjusted to zero, honestly. Where do you like to live brew time wise? I don't red herring. Don't worry about brew time. Don't don't. Don't, don't worry about brew time. Don't. Yeah, maybe if it's like one day you're brewing coffee and every day it's three minutes, one day it's six. Yeah, okay, worry about it since something went horribly wrong. But if you're having even extraction, it really, it just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. If you get that movie reference, let me know. Um. Man, that would be a deep cut if someone got it. Oh, if someone got that, I would be just like, oh my God. I'm just going to tell you, because I don't think anyone's going to get it. It's Meatballs starring Bill Murray. Wow. Cheers to that, oldie. Uh, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about brew time. Um, that should be the least of your worries because you can have a really coarse grind setting and it take forever. For instance, I have this Astribi coffee from Manhattan and it is hella light. And when I say that, I'm not saying Manhattan light. I'm saying this is like weird light for them. They only had 9% weight loss during roasting, which is dumb light. That's dummy light, all right? That's like, what are you doing light? And because of that, I can grind coarsely on my super hella aligned EK43 with SSP Brewers, and I will get with a two pour brew with no added agitation, no no swirl. We're not swirling in here. I'll get a six minute brew. Nothing I can do. Just just don't worry about the time. Time should be like the last, the like the least priority. Dial in your grind size, dial in your recipe, your ratio, all that stuff. And then you know if it's tasting really bad in your course and everything, and it's still going like that, then okay. Maybe the brew time you can look at, but it's not really something you can control. I look at brew time as like a byproduct. If it's taking five minutes, but it's tasting good, I don't give a foodie moody. You know what I'm saying? I don't give a tootie booty. You know what I'm saying? So, all right. We're just trying to, yes. We're just trying to extract the best flavors and nothing else. You know it. Uh, do you change your, your pour pattern when using a V60? Yes. Okay. So the pour pattern I change is I never, I might do, let's say I accidentally grind too finely. Or even better, because that doesn't really happen. Well, it does, but I'll explain how this happens. Let's say I had a coffee dialed in. It was really freaking good. And then I usually, on the next coffee, unless I've done something like it, if it's anywhere, if on paper, sorry about that. That was all. That was embarrassing. Uh, if it's similar at all to the previous coffee I was grinding, I'll just do the same grind setting, see what happens. Let's say I do it, and I'm like, mm, that needs to be a little coarse. That was too fine. That like took longer to drain, which is not the worry, but that can be a signifier that can be a signifier of stuff, right? So it's a signifier. It's not something to like, my point is don't fixate on it. It's a it's a potential signifier. It's not even a, 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 a direct signifier. It's like a potential signifier. So you see it, 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 took, it took long to drain and it was tasting kind of bitter. You're like, okay, it was probably, it was too fine. I'm like, 
bada bing, bada boom. All right. So it's like, this coffee is not that light. It shouldn't be stalling that long. It shouldn't be going that long. It's just too fine. So then you go coarser. But the next day you forget to go coarser and you grind the coffee and you look at it and you go, you son of a motherless goat. That's another movie reference. Son of a motherless goat. In the movie. You can't. I'm trivia king. It's three amigos. Um, it's Steve Martin. Martin Short. Chevy Chase. Yeah. Movie buff. Don't play with me. Okay. So, um, pause. I am just watching the movie in my head. I cannot remember my rant I was on. Time. We are on time. We are on changing it. We are on changing it. And there we are. We're back in it. And I lost it again. It's right there. Pick it out of the air. Pick it out of the air. Pick it out of the air. Unique New York. Unique New York. Unique New York. Unique, blah, blah, blah. Wow, I can't even do that right now. Jeez, why did I even do that? That just put me right back down the path. I'll lead you down the path that rocks. In person, new groove. Um, so yeah, pouring center pour. So what I might do is if I go, oh my goodness, I went, I went too fine. I forgot to change the grind setting, but I don't want to waste this, even though I know it's going to taste bad if I do my normal pour. What I'll do then is I might pour straight in the center, intentionally causing uneven extraction. Uh, and that's actually, that was inspired by Chad Wong's 2017 World Barista Championship performance. He literally, quite literally, ground like next to espresso grind size for his V60. But he just poured, I mean, he just went yeeted straight in the middle. Just a little drizzle right in the middle. And at the end, he had these craters, craters. His whole point, his whole thing, and I don't think he necessarily knew this at the time, but his whole thing was grinding much finer. He was noticing that he'd get a lot more aroma, a lot more aroma. But if he moved that kettle at all, it extracted too much and muted it. So he's sitting there and he's pouring straight into the middle and he's not agitating. He's not moving around at all. He's not collapsing the edges of the bed. He is purposely under extracting that coffee heavily. Yes, there is going to be some of that like caramelized compounds that are get through because he's staying in the middle. And it wasn't like the lightest coffee. That was like a, you know, it was like a properly roasted coffee. It wasn't like light even in today's standards. It wasn't Nordic or anything. And so sit in the middle, just sitting there. And it produces a really under extracted like sour kind of cup, unless you have a coffee that, uh, unless a, you go fine enough to where it's like, well, you extract that small amount of coffee, it's hitting, it's still going to be hitting proper UI. But he he did that with a really soluble coffee, sat right in the middle, and it allowed just a really fra uh, fragrant, aromatic cup, right? Low body, um, super fragrant, aromatic, because there's no agitation. He was holding back, using that coffee bed as like a heavy filtration unit, and he wasn't able to get a lot of body. Even though it was creating a lot of colloids, it was creating a lot of those suspended oils, wasn't able to get through that filter because that bed was like, macho macho man right and that that filter is not letting it through so anyway so i'll single pour sometime right in the center at the end of it if i if i start pouring and I, i'm like realizing wow this is really fine then i might just center pour gently and like hold that pour for a bit and i won't touch it i'm like just drain through baby i want this to go through fast uh because if it stalls, it ain't ever going through. So I got to make sure I'm pouring slowly enough to not to not charge out those particles into that paper filter and slow it down. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. Okay. I don't want to ruin that bed. Essentially, the harder you pour, the more you're just tearing that up, right? You don't want to do that when you're fi too fine. And you may see this during your bloom. You may not even think it's fine, but maybe that specific coffee doesn't want to drain in general. And so you're pouring the bloom and it's not really draining like it normally does. Normally, you know, it's like... <laughs> And it sucks that water through. And maybe you're like, oh my God, there's a puddle on the balloon. What the, what is going on? Then maybe I'll revert to a center pour and I won't circle. I won't do anything. I won't turbulent. I won't turbulato it. No, I'll just center stream laminar. And maybe I'll go really slow. Maybe I'll think, sometimes I'll go, all right, but I need a little bit more contact time because this is actually a quickly draining coffee. It's just too fine. It'll be bitter if I cause too much agitation. But I need I need a longer brew. I do need more contact time, okay? And so I sit in that center and I'll pour even slower with laminar flow because I don't want to have a ton of agitation, but I need the contact time. So I'm sitting there, I'm just pouring for two minutes. Sometimes I'll go straight two minutes depending on how the coffee is. So there's all these different ways of pouring and, and approaching it and speeds and the, uh, the grams per second and the, uh, how long you're uh, allowing it, where you're pouring in it. I never go outside of a quarter, though. I never go outside of a one inch diameter, about, you know, 2.2 centimeter diameter. That is that is where I live, baby. I just 
right in there. Even on even on the uh, Kalita's flat bottoms, I'm just sitting there and mm, mm, I'm just in my I'm in my zone. I'm in my I'm in my good place. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, there we go. Y'all seen Teenage Mutant Ninja Tur Turtles too? Uh, where the pizza delivery guys like Karate uh, Karate Master. And they're at the beginning, the robbers are thieving the mall, thieving the mall. You know, that's a verb. They're thieving the mall. Uh, and then uh, Donatello's um, acting like he's the dummy. And they come over and, you know, hit him. And he's like, doom, doom. Anyway, I was trying to be like that. Okay. All right. Struggling to dial on Porbers with SSPMP on a P64. Yes, though, that makes sense because there's a narrow window for uh, Porbers on that bad boy. V narrow window. All right. So when you're doing the SSP multipurpose, you have to understand that A, you have a narrow window. B, you 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 don't have to go fine. A lot of people are like, yeah, it doesn't create many fines, so I can go finer, which unlocks more flavor. I go, oh, I can go more coarsely and because it's creating less fines. And then I can agitate even more without having a clogged brew. That's what I think. I think, oh, that's gonna let me go coarser. And I won't clog my brew. I won't stall it, even though I agitate that bad boy to king come. You know what I'm saying? That's what I think. So I would say I, I, I vote you go coarser. Do the Rohan method if you like. He goes for that, like, extract all the extraction you can at the coarsest setting you can, if you know what I'm saying. So you're not hitting high numbers, but you're hitting high efficiency. You know what I mean? Do you find it easier to produce better pour overs with an immersion method like the clever dripper? So yes, obviously it is going to be a lot lower fail rate with an immersion dripper, but that is completely up to you. If that's your steez, if that's your style of coffee, it is not my style of coffee. That's too big. If I want like a buttery mouthfeel, I'm doing something like a concentrated shot on an espresso machine, not an espresso shot, a concentrated shot and diluting it. I have the hiccups. That's weird. I'm trying to contain them. Um, so if I'm wanting body, that's kind of where I'm going, personally. Um, but yeah, Clever's cool. Clever's cool. Um, you know, Air Press is cool. French Press is cool. Whatever you like is cool. And it's objectively much more easy uh, to get a good extraction because, I mean, it's immersed. It's, it is, it's doing what it's got to do. You know what I mean? Also, another shout out to Rohan. Got a great Clever uh, recipe. Question about the water remaining in a kettle. A lot of kettles need some additional water in order for PID to properly work. So in my case, I always have some left due to people leave. The, okay. Yes. So correct. In a lot of kettles, there is a minimum amount necessary in order for the PID controller to reflect accurately the temperature in the kettle itself. So let's say that you do a 15 gram pour over 250 grams of water. So every day you meticulously weigh out 250 grams of water because you don't want to leave any in your boiler because you know you're a good scientist. You know that when you boil and reboil and reboil water, Water, it's just the quality's kind of waning. You don't want it to do that. We're not doing that, okay? We're going to keep our mineralized water in the fridge. We're not doing that in the boiler, in the kettle. And so you're weighing it out 250 and you're getting erratic results. You're going, what the heck? I'm doing everything perfectly. I'm even using a poor dispersion screen. Blech! Uh, well, guess what? It's probably because your kettle's being erratic and it's easy to prove if you have a thermoprobe, but, or even just a simple thermometer, but yeah. So on like the time war, you need like, I will say, I think they lowered the amount. They put like a stronger something in there. I don't know. It's different probe, but that one, the original time war needed 500 milliliters of water in order for accurate PID readings. Uh, this new one, they, they say is like 400 or 350 or something. I think, um, the fellow, I can't remember what I measured it. At. I don't know what they claim, but it was. I mean, it was a bigger amount. It was like 400 or something in order for the PID to be somewhat accurate. None of these are perfectly accurate, by the way. You throw a probe in there and you fish around and you're getting, you're not getting what is displayed on the screen. It's fine. Um, just know that it's not like if you can't put it in a research paper, 94 degrees Celsius water, unless you, you double check it with like a proper probe and thermometer. But um, all right. Wow. Shoddy. Uh, 55 is a throwback. That was a while ago. I'm behind on chat. So sorry about that. What about filters as a factor? I really like Cypress filters. Yes. Filter is a big factor. Great question. So we have filters, filters galore. We got, a, we, we got filters. We got filters galore. We got light rose filters. We got dark rose filters. We got Abaca filters. We got Hario filters. We got medium light, whatever filters, filters for you, filters for me. Um, 
And yes, this is a good question. If you were to take a lot of these under a microscope, you were to really kind of enhance the photo and look at it, there's going to be massive inconsistencies in a lot of these filters. So what you're wanting, obviously, is you want the filter to be as consistent as particle, uh, as particle. Hello, I was about to say particles, but it is what it is. You want to be as consistent as possible so that the flow is as even as possible coming out of it. So you have as homogeneous of a water throw for, through the column as possible. So whenever they're mashing up all the little pieces of new nads in order to create these paper filters, obviously, if it's not evenly, all right, if it's not evenly, you know, even, then you're going to have blotches that are thicker than other areas on that paper filter. And you can see this under a microscope. And Gagne actually did a great chapter in his book, Physics of Filter Coffee, um, that, that showed a lot of these pictures. But um, easy to find with your own microscope if you have one. I don't know. It's just something that, like, you know, sometimes people have. Um, they're making things smaller. No, bigger. Oh, bigger. That's Kevin, a.k.a. Chang, on uh, Community. So... Uh, I just saw that episode today, actually. That's what's on my mind. Um, I just had a flashback to Jim Jarmusch's coffee and cigarettes while I was pouring that coffee out. Don't ask me why my mind is so scatterbrained tonight. I'm so sorry. Maybe some are finding enjoyment in it. Maybe some are finding solidarity in it. Either way, I hope, I hope, I hope it's not a nuisance. Though I did warn people in my Instagram bio, I am a nuisance. So I feel like I'm off the hook. Um... I can't believe I broke that glass in ceramic earlier. It's been 50 minutes. My heart still hasn't, uh, my heart will not go on. Um, bum, bum, bum. In the end of time, there was a man who knew the road and the writing was written on the stone. In the ancient times. Okay. Um, I'm really hoping for James and Lance to finally review it. Oh, wait, what? The Chato ring thing. Yeah, I don't have that, but I have this. I think James did talk about it in his, uh, in his, uh, that video he did, like Thanksgiving dinner or whatever. I think he did go over it, but I have this one. Okay. Great for ADHD. Oh, I love it. Dumb and forget style brewer. Uh, dump and forget style brewer. Love it. Self regulated water introduction from the blue. But oh, okay. By the way, the channel name doesn't check out. That coffee is totally filtered. Oh, you caught me. It could be double filtered though. And so that's the layer of filtration I'm talking about. Because I would, you know, may want to use a VST filter on the tip of a syringe in order to refract this. And even still, there may be particles in it. So. Uh, sort of describe when you see uh, the 40 versions of things in your mind. Yeah, I know. Got distracted. What are you brewing? Uh, sorry, it's too late now. Someone already answered you. Do they just clean because Cuff gets caught in the ruffles and that annoys me? I'm okay with the bypass trade off. Yes, that is one of the issues with Kalita. I'm that I hate it. I don't like it. I don't like April. I don't. Well, it's it also you can't really get flat, uh, you can't really flatten out your uh, the filters in there. I enjoy stag and Aurea, and that's because I can use a negotiator in them. Get rid of those ruffles. If I want ruffles, I'll eat a bag of chips. <laughs> Dad jokes. Um, but in my coffee, I want a bed I can lay on. So I did there? Lays? Okay. God. How's the Garjuino going? The Garjuino's done. I filmed today. Look at that. <laughs> Do you just make good coffee and drink good coffee? Yep. What's the biggest element you should change when using a light versus medium roast in the pour over process? First would be temperature, probably. Temperature or ratio. Those are the two big boys I would definitely go after. Uh, temp, I'd drop the temp. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yeah, ratio. I'd, if you're one to 17, I'd drop a full number down one to 16. Usually if it's, if in my mind, I have my own cat, everyone has their own categories. When they see something, they go, that's dark, that's medium, that's light. And then they have their own little spectrum. In my mind for my light, medium, dark, I'll go a full number for each one. So I go light, I'm doing one to 17, medium, I'm doing one to 16, dark, I'm going one to 15. And then I might make nuances from there. And then with, uh, um, Water temp, medium roast, I'm doing around 92 degrees. Dark roast, I'm doing around like 86 degrees. Celsius. Best tips for getting better. Pour overs and espresso out of decaf. Don't try to extract really heavily. Don't. There's not as much to extract. 
it's the same tip as always, you know, don't push that extract really hard. I will say though, a lot of people, you just, it's it, a big fallacy I see is people are like, how do you brew better decaf? How do you brew better decaf? The fact is, is you're not getting good decaf. And I'm not saying I have the answer for you. It's because roasters sometimes are pig headed, nanny headed. What is it? They're, um, They're cotton-headed ninny muggins, okay? A lot of these roasters are cotton-headed ninny muggins. I have to be thematic. I've done all these other movies. I need to do a Christmas movie. So what they're doing is they're not paying attention to their decaf because decaf is expensive. And so they're going, I'm already paying more for the decaffeination process, so I don't want to get a high-quality one. And I'll just get this one and say it's an 85, and we'll sell it for a lot, and I'm just not going to think about it, and it's crap. But I'm going to tell people it tastes like you can't even tell the difference. That's what's going on, guys. You're just not getting great decafs. Because um, honestly, when you get a good decaf, it's really not that hard to brew well. It just it really isn't when you get a good one. And some of you have had good ones know this. The ones who are you're like, oh my God, how do I brew it? It's because you're not getting good ones. And it's not your fault. It's not, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Will, it's not your fault. Another movie reference. One of my faves. OG. Um, yeah, that's just one of the issues is, you know, there's crap decaf out there. But I would say a lot of times my approach with crap decaf, because sometimes I want decaf, which actually I should probably be drinking decaf right now. This coffee's gone cold. Don't sue me for not finishing this coffee. But what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to brew up a, it's an old decaf. So we'll be able to talk about old coffee too. I have an old decaf that honestly was just okay out of the box. I will say it's not bad because it does have it. You know, I like EA. So whenever you're buying a decaf, I would recommend looking at ethyl acetate processed coffees. Uh, Swiss water is a very famous one. I'm not a big fan, to be honest with you, of the Swiss water process, unless it's on like Ethiopia coffees. I've found good success with Ethiopia decafs uh, from Swiss water, but other ones, they get this like weird kind of soy sauce kind of like not good vibe going on about it that I've just not been a fan of. But ethyl acetate on Central and South Americans have been a lot better. But anyway, this is a blend of um, a Swiss water, Ethiopia, and then ethyl acetate, Columbia. Um, uh, we're about out of it, though, so don't go trying to buy it because I'm drinking it. This is not a promotion for it. Um, so I'm not even going to show what it was. Hopefully it didn't show up. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to I'm just going to brew this. We're going to we're going to have some fun. So I'd like to lower the temp a bit. I, I'm trying to pull out acidity. Uh, there's not much in it to begin with. And then it's old. It's probably two ish months off roast. And I didn't vac seal it or freeze it or put it in an like environment with no freaking oxygen, whatever it is. I didn't nitrogen flush it or carbon dioxide flush it. It's just sitting on my shelf. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to grind pretty coarse. I'm going to use colder water. I'm going to do a short and concentrated brew. And guess what? If I brew it and it's chewy, I'm just going to add water to it and dilute it a smidge. Here's the thing. It's not a crime to dilute. So if you need to get that really heavy acidity out of your coffee, under extract it and you're going to get some bump in acidity. And then just guess what? If you're like, God, that's just the texture is weird. Stretch it out with some water. Who cares? I don't. I don't care. And I'm the only one you should be seeking approval from. <laughs> right? So, doesn't matter. We're going round two ski on a brewski. Actually, wow, we're at an hour. I'll probably do 15 more minutes. We'll do 15, hour 15. I'm cool with that. I've been trying, I've been thinking not going over an hour because an hour is long. And I can be a lot. And I don't want to drive people away. I don't want them to be like, oh my God, Lance just won't shut up. He loves the sound of his own voice, which in your defense is true. But uh, I mean, what you gonna do when I do na -na -na? Okay, we're gonna go a little coarser than last time. But there we go. Just kind of stir a little with your finger. Ah! I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I know someone of you was waiting on that, so I had to give it. Okay. Ooh, I do, I do, I do, I do. Yeah, yeah. I do, I do, I do, I do. Oh, you got me helpless. Doing lives at night is fun. 
I'm probably extremely overbearing right now, but let me tell you, I am loosened up in the evenings, and my brain is just firing on all cylinders. ADHD is firing on all cylinders. But I don't, I don't, I think we agree that's not a bad thing. Well, I said it wasn't a bad thing, and no one disagreed. At least I didn't read anyone disagree. So I'm gonna stick with that as the reality is no one disagrees. So ADHD. Okay. I'm gonna speed through these. Rich kids always get the girls. What does that even mean? Meatballs. Oh, yes, you're talking about meatballs. Yes. Yes. So, oh, you knew meatballs too. Wow. I can't believe it. I've been down to a little. Okay. How's Manhattan tasting for you? Mine is still resting since I had zero time. So it's, he's going to re-roast it. I told him to go up to like at least 10 and a half percent. It's got to be darker. Better late than never. Caught up in trivia. Is it worth to invest in Goosenet Kettle for V6? You want to switch with regular kettle? It's get really good. No. If you ever have something, listen, if you ever have a situation where what you're brewing is really good, why are you trying to change that? I'm giving you a look like Gina Linetti would give you a look. Okay. <laughs> okay. God, that's another piece of glass. Just a little housekeeping. Okay. Solve the Rubik's Cube. We'll solve one. Oh, is it stressing you out that it's unsolved back there? Okay, I love filter dealer Lance. Yes. Does reboiling distilled water cause any problem? Not, not, not like, you know, like once I just wouldn't keep, uh, honestly, that one I can't really speak of because I've never really seen studies on distilled water. So I can't speak to it. And I'm sure Sama would have a theory because he understands crap more than I do. But all I can really speak to is I've seen uh, a tea kettle study. Um, yeah. Uh, Joe Mansell there does me. I'm halfway drunk one on wine. Wow. Funny. I love that. You're having an absolute blast with sky brands. Yes. No, not the Oreo, the Chato hoop. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying they're kind of similar, right? Aren't they? Isn't the Chato hoop just like a big flat bottom dripper? Maybe I'm wrong. It's very supporting. This Lance energy is really something. Oh, I'm sorry, Jason. It's not always like this. This is late night Lance. This is L and L. It's L and L. For me, it's eleven fourteen. Just say so you no. Know, it's ridiculous on speaker and one of my only two eateries open. <laughs> oh, I love it. Bought some decaf Ethiopian from Sweet Marie's. I'm going to roast my person. There we go. Do it. Decaf Ethiopia sounds like a clogging king. You're not wrong. Uh, still want to get some nice decaf only. No. What is this? It's Manhattan. Seems like they got a lot more expensive lately. I don't think they've got more expensive. Maybe. I'm excited to see how you're going to brew the decaf. Yes. Okay, I've caught up. H have the legend of the rent stuck in my head on loop. Yes. But the legend of the rent is where I go. Oh, that's that was too high for me at night. That's the other thing. My voice goes down. Do I call? Yeah. When do we get the wine you made with your feet? It's being bottled as we speak. I would love a dedicated filter and unfiltered episode about decaf brand reviews, tips for brewing, challenging decafs, and general chats about where decaf are going because some people need it. I agree. Some people need it. I need it. Shoot. Look at me now. Look at me now, dad. That's uh, Pierce Hawthorne from Community. Another community one. Oh, not clickable, I guess. Uh, in your opinion, um, why are flat bottom drippers a lot more used in last year's Brewer's Cup? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, well, some of it is trendiness. So oftentimes, uh, these these competitive brewers are very much affected by trends, uh, and they get sent a lot of free gear. That's honestly that, a dirty little secret. And I'm saying this is going to go public, but a dirty little secret is uh, uh, so many people are using Comandantes because they were giving them. They were giving them. And it's easy. Like, people need hand grinders uh, whenever they're traveling for competition. Breezes are broke. They're broke. And so you get a three hundred dollar hand grinder. What else are you going to use? Come on, of course you're going to use that. And then over time, you know, other other competitors got in the market, and now Easy Presso won last year or two years ago, and last year or something. Um, and it's because they they're giving competitors grinders. So even though someone won with a ZP six, doesn't mean that's the best grinder. World. I mean, I think it is a very freaking good filter hand grinder. Uh, but that those competitions do not reflect reality at all, at all. At all, at all, at all. The fact of the matter is, is most of those coffees you could spit on get a 1% TDS and it's still going to score well. And the reason is because they're so heavily processed that you're not even really tasting the coffee, you're tasting the process, right? Here, I've been I've been distracted. Let me go ahead and start this. Some of you are probably like, oh, he's doing it without even looking. No, I can't do that. Um, I am like very, very, very just like, I probably wouldn't be able to do it while talking, but I'm very much just okay at the rube of the cube. Um, but anyway, let's see. 
where are we at on questions? Questions. We are at. What espresso paper filters do you use? Recommend? I use. Uh, I mean, I usually use the Weber ones that are Cafec. They do a good job. Can confirm we are broke gaff. Yes. Do you typically use RDT for hand grinders? I have the X Pro. I d I don't. I don't. Also on decaf, I had to give up caffeine for some time, and it's really hard to find good decaf. Yeah, that makes sense. I paid for my Z ZP6. Oh, yeah. Sorry. If you would have told them you were competing, they likely I went way hotter than I meant. So we're just gonna take that lid off and let it show for a sec. I'm gonna finish this. That initial cross is the thing that like always um I get distracted really easily on. Like so easily. Now that we got that cross, we're good to go. Um, okay, let's see. Favorite stand up. Are we getting into this? Okay, maybe I'm gonna end, I'm gonna like end the stream. That's so weird to say because I'm saying it in the video that's going to be live. But anyway, uh, no, actually, let's we'll talk about this. This is going to be included on the stream. I don't give a toot. I don't give a hoot toot and rowdy cowgirl. Um, all right. So my favorite stand-up comedian of all time is probably Steve Martin. Um, love his first two routines. I mean, they are just iconic AF. I'm a huge fan of absurdism. So, um, yeah, that would that that is definitely... My answer for that, I would say second might be um, Hans Taven, probably Hans Taven. Um, and then I would say like third, fourth, and fifth are made up of like um, Richard Pryor, George Carlin, maybe, actually that fifth part's harder to, harder to fill than I thought. Honestly. Some of Chris Rock's early stuff's pretty good. And I do like Dave Chappelle, some of his earlier stuff, so, you know. But uh, we're getting a little controversial here. I should probably... It, it, it depends on the stuff, right? Right. I feel like... No, you know, you know how it is. Um, what number did you give guide ZP6 as course on when you ha when, you, when you brew? Uh, I, I do, I mean, a five and a half. Tried to get free gear from some companies, wasn't able to. Yeah, you gotta kind of make a name for yourself. You don't do your Instagram, man. You gotta do more Instagram. They want to see you have a presence. 64 MP versus 98 HU for espresso. What are the taste differences? What are your preference? My preference is 98 HU for espresso, no question. Now, the reason, a big reason is because um with You are objectively getting more heat damage the smaller burst size you go. That doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be worse than a corollary bigger size. But what it is going to mean is there is a much higher potential at a bigger size because there's more efficient space for the grounds to spread out. So you have less kind of rubbing of the grounds to create a lot more heat. Obviously, you're getting more static because when you are getting static, it's because you're producing heat, producing energy, et cetera, et cetera. So this gets into your whole triple electrification. The shorter the the the, the, the bean path, the shorter the uh, uh, the more clogged up the system is going to get, the more burr rubbing, the more heat, the more heat damage. Heat damage is pretty dang apparent to me. Um, and so I'm not saying I don't enjoy 64 multipurpose, but side by side, the HU all the way. Um, that doesn't mean all 98s are better than 64 MP. That does not mean that in the slightest. Uh, but the 98 HU for me, it definitely does. I do not like John Mulaney. I'm sorry. Someone asked, do I like John Mulaney? I do not like observational comedy at all. And that's all I, I like. For me, it's just not entertaining. I went to the dentist today and they get put a tongue depressor in my mouth. Why is that depressed? Ugh. You know, or like Seinfeld. Oh, I went to the, you know, I'm just not, you know, that type of stuff. I'm just not into, but you know, it is what it is. Next level brewer worth it if you already have a switch. I don't ever use mine, to be honest with you. It's a little too much faff. Hans Tabin. Yes, someone knows Hans Tabin. Yes. Are you from Netherlands? You, um, anyway, I love Steve Martin's early albums. Oh, they're the bomb. Also, love how you pronounce his name. Is it correct? Did I say it correctly? I think I say it correctly because he sings it. In one of his specials, he sings it. He has it in his uh, his act. Um, do you find Vario uh, micro levers good enough for dialing an espresso? Vario micro levers. Oh, on the, sorry. Oh, my mom went to lever espresso. I wasn't thinking Vario the grinder. Uh, yes, it is. They are good enough. I just do not like messing with them. But yes, they're definitely good enough. Uh, definitely good enough. 
Gun rate for over early one line electric gun says I'm gonna do this. Someone is yeah, 078S for pour over is not that good. You 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 come to a similar conclusion. Sigan O2, but what burrs would give me a similar taste profile like the C40? You don't want to eclipse the C40, you just want to match the C40. That's my De Niro face. It's probably crap. Um probably cast. That's the speed cast. Or honestly, nope, take it back. The fellow owed Gen 2 burrs, they'll be better than C40. And they're cheap, relatively speaking. Uh, 98 HU compared to EK stock burrs. So that's a great question. It really depends on your taste preferences. There are some coffees I'd prefer stock burrs, some I'd prefer HU. Um, if you're going for, yeah, it really depends. If you're going for a little bit more body and more sweetness than the stock burrs on EK, no question. If you're going for more clarity than the HUs, they're just very different burrs. Uh, have you tried many Chinese coffees? A few roasters here in Melbourne are roasting Yunnan coffee. Um, I actually had a Yunnan coffee from... Um, Calete, Calete in Melbourne, in Melbs. Um, I've had a few Chinese coffees. So do burrs with more pre-breaking and faster grinding it create more or less friction? The faster the pre-breaking, likely the more friction because it's a more efficiently cutting those beans and getting them to the finishing teeth, which is where they're going to clog. All right, when I say clog, obviously I don't mean you have to unscrew it and open it up. But no, that's where it's going to slow down drastically. So if you think about it, let's see visually. Here's a burr, a flat burr. Beans are fed in. They're going to boom, go through those pre-breakers so fast. So fast. Uh, because it's just like cut. They're cut and they're, dip, 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 they go. Bup, 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 bup. And then they get caught in that finishing bit. The finishing bit's usually pretty small. And so they're like, okay, we're running. We're going around in circles waiting to get ejected. We're waiting. We're ready. We're ready. And so it takes a few laps takes a few just around the river band and then boom, it's ejected, right? So that's where that static is being created. So more faster pre-breaking is likely going to cause more heat up at the end. Now, um, that's why something like a pre-breaker is great, uh, like a separate pre-breaker, like an auger that acts as a pre-breaker or just an auger in general is going to pre-break the coffee, period. And you're going to get less heat level. Yeah. <sighs> okay. He trash talking about C40 with live and unfiltered. Hey. I do what I want. Yes, I'm Dutch. And no, especially Hans Tabin's last name is very, very Dutch and hard to pronounce correctly. Oh, okay. What kind of filters do you like? He sings it in a special, though, and I felt like he said Tabin. Tabin. I don't know. Anyway, it's close enough. Um, all right. I can't keep looking at chat. I need to brew this coffee, uh, and then I'm going to get off chat because I want to drink my coffee. Just around the river bend. Little Ronnie. He has this bit. So for those of you who don't know Hans, he has this bit that like got me sucked into his stuff where he, he, he covers his hand with a sock. Okay. And he calls it Cousin Ronnie. All right. And he gets on stage and he introduces the crowd to Cousin Ronnie. And he says, you know, he starts by going like, um, I love you. And he wants, you know, uh, cousin Ronnie to say, I love you back, but he doesn't goes, I love you. <laughs> I love you. I love you. I love you. And he keeps doing it over and over again. And finally, Oh, I'm, wait, no, that's not how it goes. Oh, I'm butchering this. Cause then he goes, yes. Oh, he says, do you love me? That's it. Do you love me? And then finally the, the sock goes like this. And there, it, it, the voice in the mouth is not in sync, and it keeps going until it gets in sync. And then they show that they have a uh, a, 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 a song they want to present, and Hans starts singing like this opera, <laughs> da, da, da. and he just starts feeding like a like a payday or a baby Ruth or something to the sock. So it's just eating a candy bar as he's singing opera. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. I love it. Okay, um, let me get this. Let me. Okay, this is definitely cold enough. <laughs> Oh, I love Hans Tatum. All right. Sorry about that. I probably butchered that joke. I need to go watch that again now. I don't like butchering jokes. Get in there. Oh, 15 on the dot. You know I like that. All right, so when I'm brewing decaf, I like to lessen it. So I am going a little slowly, and I'm actually breaking up the pour. Uh, so this is something else. If I don't want to do heavy agitation, because even agitating the bloom with a with a with a swirl can clog it, 
decafs produce a lot of fines, right? So agitating that bloom can cause clogging. So I don't want to do the swirl. I found that it does, it can really increase the chances of clogging. So even though I ground coarsely, I am do, I'm not touching that bloom. I am doing a pour here at the beginning where I'm letting the stream break up intentionally. What that allows is it hits and it doesn't really penetrate very far. So it's not immediately going through the bed. Instead, it just kind of sits there and it saturates that bed nice and slowly. And we get a, a slower, uh, a longer time before that initial drip goes down. And it allows for more coverage of that bed without needing to actually agitate it. So we're able to take more time and get more of that surface area. Now I am gonna just kind of like sit in the center because I don't want a big extraction here. It doesn't taste good when you extract high, you get really, really bitter. Some like some sulfuric notes is just not, it's just not good. It just doesn't, oh, I'm so glad some of you know meatballs. <gasps> oh, it's so good. Oh, I love it. Oh. At the beginning, uh, you know, when he's in the parking lot and the news comes to interview him for camp. Um, oh, my goodness. Camp. Oh, the, the rival camp. I'm blanking on everything. But he's discussing with him how he gives all the kids $200 and they have to make it their way around the world, you know, fighting a bear. And um, we won't go into it because there's some inappropriateness up there. But it's that is that is proper comedy. Um, oh, good night, Devin. I didn't see that. So, well, what's your go-to water recipe, GHKH, for espresso and SSP MP? I don't have a go-to. I do it based off the roaster completely. Well, actually, for espresso, I do tend to have a go-to. I tend to play around 15-ish GH, 50 to 60-ish KH. Uh, I've not tried CAFX Deep 29 or 27, whatever. Um, yeah, so for, for espresso, yeah, it's typically around that 15, 60-ish. Um, kind of does pretty good. You don't understand that kind of comedy. What, absurdist comedy? I love absurdist comedy. Absurdism is my jam. And Steve Martin created it. That's why I'm so addicted to some of it, to his early stuff. He literally, so Steve Martin, to give you a little history of uh, some stand-up. Steve Martin, um, you know, he was in the wake of the Vietnam War. Everything was really tense in the U.S. Like the tension was at uh, you know, an all-time high, right? And so uh, everything was just serious and blah, blah, blah. So Steve Martin, when he was taking an English class, the, the definition of comedy or of humor um, that was given to him in his textbook said, humor is, this, or comedy is essentially the building up and releasing of tension. Right. So you're building up tension, then you release it so that people feel good that they're releasing the tension. They laugh. Right. And so he was really thinking about that. And he was like, OK, but what if what if I just kept building the tension? You know what I'm saying? What if I just kept building it and building it? And I'm going to no, I'm just going to keep building it. At some point, it has to come out. Right. It's like you keep blowing an air balloon up. It's going to pop at some point. So that was his idea. And when he started his comedy shows, like he would just do the weirdest stuff. And like, honestly, if you're looking for like a joke, like with a punchline, that's not you, you won't like this because it's literally the antithesis of what he does. There are no punchlines. Um, and that's kind of the point. Right. He just keeps raising the tension. And that to me is what's so funny is how I love when people make others uncomfortable. Andy Kaufman, legend. Love Andy Kaufman. He would be in the top five. There you go. That rounds up my top five. I love Andy Kaufman. Um, but that that idea of, of he, you know, he would, okay, everybody, tonight I like to start my show by doing one thing that is impossible. So tonight I'm going to suck this piano into my lungs. He pulls a straw out of his pocket and just, okay, and then he moves on to the next thing. That's not funny because it's not a joke, right? He's building the tension. You're sitting there waiting for the joke and it never comes. You sit there and you're like, this guy's serious? And then he keeps doing it. You're like, this guy's serious? Like, what? And then you just keep feeling awkward until eventually you like have to laugh. There has to be that break of tension. Naked gun, airplane. Oh, I love those. Love it. Um, trying to find a cheap manual grinder to use on the go with a similar profile to SSP MP. Would a K6 be a good option? Um, it would be, it would be, a, yeah, it would be an adequate option. That'd be an adequate option. Absolutely. Especially at that price point. I used to love, love Leslie Nielsen is great. It's a member that apparently all roasters in the Netherlands don't seem to use custom water. Seem to you're right. And in fact, my buddy Ben Morrow doesn't even know his water, which actually frustrates me. Um, I keep telling him to get a water test and he hasn't yet. And I'm like, dude, what are you even what are you doing, man? No one uses custom water. Like Rob in a matter of concrete, dude. What are you using? Bro. Oh, I never finished this. Um, it's because ADHD. Um so yeah, I think that's about it for today. I, I know I didn't go nearly as deep as I meant to, but it's because ADHD was on full throttle tonight. And I apologize to those that may have wanted a little bit more and were um, like that new patron. I'm very sorry. 
Um, you know, it's one of those things. It's like what you see is what you get. And uh, I'm not a perfect person. I'm silly and I'm crazy and I'm cool. Um, come on, I just need to line up one of these. There it is. There it is. Um, yeah, so oh, I accidentally messed up. Gotta be freaking heck, whatever. I can't do it while I'm talking to people, obviously. Try to decap. Unscripted is hard. Um, uh, well, it's not that it's hard. It's because, it's because I have ADHD. And honestly, my videos... Okay, real quick. To make sure things clear, because I feel like there was an implication there, Justin. Nothing I have ever done on any social media platform has been scripted. Never, not one time, not even an iota. Okay? All off the cuff, baby. But I just feel, you know, this is unpolished. It's unfiltered. I'm just... There are impulses I have while we're filming and that I don't succumb to. I'm succumbing to them here. You know? It's like... It is what it is. Uh, there's, it is what it is. So I'm just going to succumb. I'm just going to succumb. Um, but again, that's because it's late at night and I get, I have an extra dose of crazy at night. That is not typical during the day or in the morning, especially in the mornings. We typically film in the mornings. So I'm a bit, I'm a lot more calm. Yes. Me in the videos is calm. Uh, boom. We got some melon out on that. That was nice. So again, uh, just to, just to, as a final note, as we're at the hour 20 mark, when we're looking at all these variables, what is important to understand is that everything takes a massive thing. You can't just take, um, you can't just always change temperature, always change grind size, or always change ratio. You need to take a little bit of each, and you need to figure out how they're affecting the coffee for your palate every time. There's not an objective way it's going to hit every single time. So you have to figure out what it does based on your palate, right? Because as we said, two extraction numbers don't mean the same taste, right? So um, take into account your uh, your flow rate, take into account the amount of pours you're doing. The more pours you do, the more extraction you have. That's why I never do more than two pours. I get a lot more discharge and a, a, so a lot more of the particulates are making. So here's the thing. I don't do more than two pours because the more time you pour, the more kettle agitation there's going to be after it's settled, which is going to re unsettle the bed, which is going to cause more discharge of particulates through the paper filter into that final cup. Because no matter how good a filtration unit that bed is, the more you upset the bed, the, the, the more time you're giving and the more ability you're giving for those microparticles that can fit through the paper filter to fit through the paper filter. You don't believe that there are those microparticles? Well, guess what? You're wrong. In fact, if you want to figure it out, you can just take the TDS of a um, of uh, unfiltered filter coffee, then filter it through a VST syringe and, and, and read it again. There are particulates that make it through and those can obfuscate your palate. That's a well-known thing. And the bed of the coffee is a great way to stop them. You only do two pours. You're letting that, you're letting that freaking filter become robust AF. You're not letting that, those particulates get out again. But anyway, the more you pour, the more you're going to upset the bed, the more you're going to particular uh, extract your coffee, the more part uh, particulates can potentially get through the cup, into the cup, obfuscating your palate, lower, uh, increasing the astringency because astringency are compounds and they can fit through those filters. Um, so you're, you're just doing a lot of harm. So I wouldn't, uh, but, but if you know, if you need to, if you feel like you need to increase some pore pattern, you can, I would never, I would never use that as a variable personally, but I really want that clarity. And there are sometimes particulates can aid in body, uh, but you're taking a risk with that, right? So. Anyway, all right. See when the chat is distracting. It is. Uh, no worries. I would say you pretty much caught up with the chat. Now I drink your decaf. No, I cover your lease some kids and better some. That's right. That's a great. That would be great. Uh, we could do that. Yeah. Yeah. We could do something like that. All right. Well, I am going to hop off now. This was a long one, but it was a good one. Um, tell your friends, tell your family. Because uh, uh, unfiltered's here. Unfiltered and unscripted. You know what I mean? Uh, and I think I hit the topic 40% of the time at a 40% extraction rate in that video. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to head off now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll post this. Uh, I probably won't edit it because I don't really feel like it. Cause it'll take like 24 hours to edit. So I'll probably go ahead and post it. So if you came in late, you can go watch the beginning part, but, uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you so much. Love you all. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe. If there's any of you who have not hit the subscribe, you know, you are. Okay. Love you. Drink something, brew something tasty, and drink something tasty as well, because it's tasty too. And bye.